Okay. Hi, I'm Lisa. And I'm Kristen, and this is The Order of Junia. And today we are delighted to be interviewing Sharon Miller, who is the teaching pastor at Bright City Church in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, so we're just going to jump straight in here, and we always start and end with the same two questions with all of our interviews, Sharon. So we know that God calls each of us to seminary in many different ways. So can you tell us how you knew seminary was the path for you or how you ended up applying? Just part of that story. Yeah, so I went to college, majored in religion, felt a call to ministry, but as a woman, <laughs> And so I did not know where I would where where I would go next. And so after I graduated from college, I moved back to Charlotte, which is where I'm from, and I actually worked for Proverbs 31 Ministries for one year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, back then it was very tiny. There were like five of us on staff, and a lot of people had never heard of it. And so I was their first intern. I traveled with. Lisa Turkhurst and learned about speaking and women's ministry and having, you know, a nonprofit ministry, all of that. But when I was traveling with her, I was noticing how a big part of Lisa's platform at the time was her, her own story. Like she would go and she would share a lot about her story at different conferences and retreats. And it was really powerful and really healing for a lot of women, for her to speak openly about things that a lot of women would not always be open about. And I was really amazed by this, but I was seeing this. And then I was looking around at other women in ministry at the time, like uh, Beth Moore's breaking free study was also really big then. And realizing that most of the prominent women in ministry who were authors and speakers, their authority came from their story. Mm. And so they would share, you know, whatever difficult thing they had survived and, and it was really amazing and God was using it. But the problem for me is I did not have a really good story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I grew up in a wonderful Christian home. I have amazing parents. I've always known Jesus. There was no, nothing dramatic happened mm -hmm. at all. It was just kind of a straight line journey. And so I was trying to figure out, you know, what to do if, in a world where women get their platform from their story, where they get their authority from their story, what do I do? And at some point it just clicked. I thought, well, wait a second men don't go into ministry because they have a story. If they discern a call, they steward that call by going to seminary. And so I felt like that was the way forward for me. I really loved school. I had taken some biblical Greek in undergrad and I was really eager to go back. And so that was how I decided to go to seminary. Okay. So where did you go undergrad and then where did you go to seminary? And was that the same place where you did your PhD work? No. So I went to Duke undergrad and I actually went to Duke divinity school. But the funny thing is with both of you being at Fuller, this is a really interesting story. So when I graduated from Duke, I kind of thought my time in Durham was done and had no desire to move back. And then when I was thinking about seminary, there was only one seminary that I wanted to go to, and that was Fuller. <laughs> and I had identified this is this is the place, this is the fit, all of that. And so I applied and I was accepted. And then I went out to California with my dad to visit, you know, before I made the final decision. And it was really strange because I got there and it was one of the few moments in my life where, you know, everything about Fuller is amazing. Like it's in a beautiful part of the country. It's a really great school. The campus is gorgeous, you know, all of that. And I felt no peace at all. Mm -hmm. Like God was saying, this is not where you were supposed to go. And so that was really confusing and came back home because I had not applied anywhere else. You know, this was May oh. and was like, now what? And then I happened in June to be in Durham for uh, my old college roommate's wedding. 
And so while I was here, I happened to, I just on a whim emailed the Dean of the Divinity School, like, <laughs> why not? And he was free. And so I came and met with him and said, you know, I'm trying to discern. And we had a really good conversation, but long story short, he created a space for me in the fall class at Duke. Oh, and I still to this day, I really want to, I want to sit down with him and t- be like, explain to me why you did that because wow. there's a waiting list. Like I know people that have not gotten into Duke mm. and I, I just, I mean, so it was very clear that was where I was supposed to go. <laughs> right. Yeah, definitely. And that's where I met my husband. So I was really <laughs> grateful. And then I ended up getting my PhD at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, which is outside of Chicago. Okay. 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 Oh yeah, we're circling back to the PhD. Yeah, we're we're gonna come back to that PhD conversation okay. because there, <laughs> there are women in our cohort who are thinking about PhD studies, and including me, and it, it and maybe Lisa. Um, okay. And it is it's scary to think yeah. about <laughs> what else am I getting myself into? But yeah. um, but somebody was like, hey, you're gonna be if you're going to be 60, you're going to be 60 anyway, you may as well be 60 with a PhD. So I'm like, oh, that's a good way to think about that. Um, <laughs> um, but you, so you, you met your husband, did you, you met your husband at Duke. Um, and then you and your husband, your, you and your husband um, planted a church together there. Um, and so you're a teaching pastor. Mm-hmm. What? I'm just curious because I know just renovating a house here in Charlotte Mm-hmm. Had, has has almost had my husband and I divorced. So <laughs> what what has that experience been like planting with your spouse? And, yeah. Um, and then the, another piece to that question is, have you gotten any pushback being a woman and a pastor? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, it is very hard. It's very hard. I mean, even co-teaching is, it's hard because we, we don't always co-teach, but when we do, it's challenging because the way I prepare for a sermon and the way he prepares for a sermon are very different. And so it, it has been really hard. We're thankful because we've had the same marriage counselor for 12 years now. Hey, Jesus and and therapy. She knows us. She knows us uh, really well. And so we have that foundation laid and we are really good at communication, but yeah, it's been hard mostly because we don't know that many other couples that have done this. Mm. We planted with an organization called ARC, Association of Related Churches, and they are a really large church planting organization and they're okay with women being pastors. But what we discovered very quickly was that there were a lot of women who had a title of pastor, but they were not, the wife was not leading in the same capacity as her husband. And very often did not have the same like theological training. And not to say that that is necessary for ministry because it's not, Mm -hmm. but we didn't have any, there was, there were hardly any couples that we could just call up and say, like, how did you work this out? And so we've had to find them like over the last several years, we've had to find them throughout the country and ask, pick their brains on how to do it. But otherwise we've, we've really had to feel it out. And one of the things that has been really hard that I've had to learn the hard way is I think I went into church planting thinking, okay, when we're talking about church, I'm going to have my pastor hat on And when we're not, then I'll have my wife hat on. And I started to realize that most of the time, regardless of the context, my husband was wanting the wife hat on. And at some point in the last year, I had the epiphany that it's because I am always his wife. (laughs) (laughs) You know, That's like I, I would never, I would never say to my kids, I'm taking off the mom hat right now and putting on the pastor hat with you. No, like mm. I'm always their mother and it would be really detrimental to them if I ever took off that hat, you know? And I realized that was happening similarly in my marriage. And so just, we've had to learn like a lot of things like that. So it has been hard, but it has been really beautiful. I think our, our people love it, especially when we do co-teach, our styles are very different as well. And 
I always say, I think it, it harkens back to God's initial design for men and women in the Garden of Eden. It's like an echo of what was meant to be, I think, when they see us leading together. So that it's been good and it's been hard at the same time. And then in terms of pushback, the shocking truth is no, I've mm-hmm. gotten almost no pushback. And I think some of it is because I'm married to my husband, you know, so I think a lot of people see him as still being kind of like the head, but also the thing that has been shocking is when we started recruiting for the church and we would get to the part in the pitch where we would say, and by the way, you know, Sharon's going to be pastor. I'm going to be preaching. Are you okay with that? And I would brace for impact. You know, I would think, okay, this is the moment where they're going to be out and that never happened. It never mm. happened. People were, people were thrilled. Mm. One man cried. Like the people were so ready. And that was really just amazing to see because we, even though we did not start our church as, you know, with women in ministry being our banner. It's not our soapbox. It's not something that we feel like is worth dividing over. We have a lot of friends that are complementarian, but we still felt like we were sticking our necks out on this, that there, we didn't know any other churches in the area that were doing the same thing aside from, you know, mainline Protestant, but in evangelical churches, we didn't know hardly any. And so we felt like we were sticking our necks out and realized from that response that, no, we were not sticking our necks out. You know, God, Mm -hmm. it it felt like God said, you thought you were going ahead of me. You know, I've I've gone ahead of you, Like (laughs) you are behind me. You're behind what I'm already doing. And so it was clear God had already changed hearts and we are in a more progressive area, but we are still in North Carolina. Like we're in Mm -hmm. the Bible belt. And so that to me was a big signal that the tide is, is changing on this. And that was really encouraging. Mm. That's so, I, it, 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 that's surprising to me because I, I do say North Carolina is as far North as you can go and still have the Southern hospitality, hmm. but I, I would, ex, I would, I would have, have expected that you would have gotten a lot more, um, No, I get, I get occasionally, you know, trolls on the internet, which, you know, that doesn't bother me. I suspect if our church, our church is still relatively small. I suspect if our church grows and becomes bigger, it will, it will probably like power is a really interesting dynamic. Mm -hmm. But I think because our church is still small, it feels non-threatening, but I do think a lot of it is also things are changing. Right. Right now I have a, have you always, and I don't, I I know terms are helpful so that we know where people are coming from in generally, but, but I know sometimes that to say somebody's egalitarian or say somebody's complementarian doesn't really encompass the full, like it is very like the box and, and because we live outside the box most of the time. Yeah. Have you always felt that way, even growing up that as, as a woman, um, I, I, I have equal, um, I'm equally made in the image of God that God can use me as a leader. Or did you, did that view evolve over time for you? So it, it's been a really interesting kind of like zigzaggy journey. So I grew up Presbyterian. I grew up in Charlotte at a covenant Presbyterian church, which is in the Dilworth area. And it's PCUSA. I had female pastors. I never thought anything of it as a kid. And then when I went to college, I started attending a Southern Baptist church. And really, like, once I plugged into a more evangelical faith, that was when it was like putting fertilizer on my faith. I mean, I grew like crazy. But I was at a Southern Baptist church and simultaneous to that, I was getting a lot of leadership opportunities. I was at an FCA at Duke. I was getting a lot of leadership opportunities, discerning a call to ministry and was at this one particular Southern Baptist church, which I loved And the college ministry was wonderful. The college pastors were great, but they also were 
you know, making sure I understood what is available for women and what is not. Okay. And that was the first time I'll say also, that was the first time in college that I'd even read the passages like first Timothy about women. And so I was very much of the perspective. Okay. If this is what God's word says, then this is what I will do. Like I will submit myself to God's word and that's that. And so I was, I was in college and for some of seminary, a, a complementarian. And even when I would go to Duke Divinity School and I would ask some of my classmates, you know, who were not complementarian, I'd say, you know, well, what about these passages? And they would always give me a really superficial answer that was kind of like, well, it's cultural. You know, the Bible also condones slavery. And I was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's not, a, I don't feel like you're seriously engaging scripture, you know? And, but what, meanwhile, you know, when I was in seminary, I was at a different Southern Baptist church and they had really rigorous explanations for why they held to their convictions. And so I was kind of like, okay, if I'm going to go between the one perspective where I feel like you're not really taking scripture seriously. And then this one is, I'm going to go with the one that is taking scripture seriously. And so I was at a Southern Baptist church throughout seminary, but uh, my husband actually really was struggling with it and had this one moment near the end of our time there where he said, you know, one day I'm going to have to give an account for how I stewarded the gifts of my wife. And right now I don't feel good about that. And so he was really struggling, but it was the kind of thing at at that point we were, I, at that point, this was different from the church I was at in college, but in seminary, I attended the summit church, which is JD Greer's church. And we were very close with JD and we were very close with the church. And it was not something that we would have left over, but thankfully God was gracious to us and, uh, we moved away. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we moved to Chicago for our PhDs. And so it was a natural break where it wasn't like we are making a statement by leaving over this, which I did not want to do. Like, I really loved the Summit Church to this day. Then when we were at Trinity, which is evangelical, Trinity is evenly split between the faculty. You've got DA Carson, who is complementarian, you know, founding complementarian. Mm-hmm. And then you have another half, even in the New Testament department that is egalitarian. And so that was the first time that I encountered egalitarians who took scripture seriously. Cause I'd, I'd believed like egalitarians don't take scripture seriously. Mm-hmm. And so that was the first time I was encountering egalitarians who were holding up scripture and attributing authority to the whole witness of scripture, submitting themselves to it and still saying, I'm coming to this conclusion. And that was when everything changed for me. Mm. And I still don't, I don't call myself an egalitarian. I don't love those terms. I don't use them for myself, but that was when I did say, I stopped saying I'm I'm complimentarian. That was when I, like, Mm -hmm. I I believe, like there's actually um, John Tyson in New York. He says they, believe in complementarity without hierarchy. And I think that's closer to where I am at. Um, But yeah, so that it was a very weird how I like did not start out that way. I mean, my dad is one of my biggest advocates. He, he always said, he was like, if any man ever tells you Uh because you're a woman, he was like, you do not listen to them. And so that, that's how I was raised. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He was scandalized when I was at a Southern Baptist church. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I need to go knock on your parents' door then. Yeah. (laughs) Can you adopt me? Can I be (laughs) that? I think that really speaks to how seriously you want to take scripture. Mm -hmm. Because I find that I talk about this uh, pretty frequently on Instagram or when I'm writing and people are that's the thing that they always bring up is that I take scripture seriously. Like we're not just glossing over it. And Mm. I think I've read a whole lot about it. So I could name pretty plenty of people who are taking scripture seriously, but it's like no one else knows about them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's just very interesting. Yeah. Well, it was such a, 
it was going to Ted's was this like shattering moment for me where I'd always thought, okay, compliment complementarians take scripture seriously. Egalitarians do not. Egalitarians play like fast and loose with, with God's word. And somewhere along the way, I kind of realized, wait a second, I have not been pressing on this very hard at all. Like I kind of just took this and believed it without really pressing it. But, you know, with you guys being called the order of Junia, that is such a great example of how complementarians have done the very thing that they have accused egalitarians of doing you know with junia for a time you know complementarians were translating junia as junius because they said there's no way junia could be a woman and so they changed the actual translation to fit this theological conviction and then when they finally realized, okay, actually there is no, like, this is definitely a woman. Like we have no evidence to support what we're saying. It was like, okay, well then Junia must, it must not mean what it is saying, what is clearly there. And I think that was the moment where I thought, wait a second, we are taking first Timothy, which is a confusing passage. I mean, what does it mean that women are saved through childbearing? We don't know, like we're <laughs> right. guessing, right. we can guess, but it's definitely one of the more obscure, you know, unclear passages in the Bible. And so we are taking a passage that is unclear and we are using it as the filter for understanding other passages, which are clear, you know, mm -hmm. like it is clear that Deborah had leadership authority. It is clear that Junia was an apostle. And so good hermeneutics mm -hmm. is taking passages that are clear and using them to understand the passages that are unclear, not the reverse. And so I think it was like, those are the things, and, and I'm not saying this to like shame complementarians. As I said, like I love complementarians, like not all complementarians are practicing shady hermeneutics. I'm just saying for me, I had this like thought about egalitarians that i would not really like pressed on very hard. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That, I, I, I love that you brought that up because, because just, I think just in general, uh, being in seminary, at least for me, and I don't want to speak for everyone else, but, um, but, but it makes you press on things that that you have just taken at face value and, and, mm -hmm. and we can, we can throw anything out there, um, um, and, and have that, that conversation. But I found, uh, I had a, um, when I was at Southern Evangelical, my first paper was, I had to, I had to write about why the, um, documentary hypothesis was wrong, mm -hmm. completely wrong. Um, and then when I transferred to Fuller, my first paper <laughs> was on proving the documentary hypothesis is right. And, and the text that we used definitely came from that bend. Um, and so there was a lot of cognitive dissonance going on that first, that first quarter, like, okay, wait, no, I believe that. No, wait, no, I, th I think I actually believe this. And then, and then I came to rest on if I, if I ever want to get into teaching or being a professor or something like that, I want to be someone who presents all the arguments and say, okay, let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and not, and not, and, and also be aware of my own assumptions and biases going into, um, yeah. you know, when, when we do theology and, yeah. and, and, and this is an area where Christians of good faith and a commitment to the authority of scripture simply come to different conclusions. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to be able to, hold that together and say, we can still be the body of Christ and disagree on this. Mm -hmm. And especially at a time yeah. when there is so much division and polarization, I'm not saying we need to, women need to be, you know, one with men who are using complementarianism as, you know, a veil for misogyny. I'm not saying mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. but with, with complementarians of good faith and, and who love women and, and want to advocate for women in every possible way that they can within their convictions, a hundred percent, we are brothers and sisters. We can take communion together. We can serve together. We can cheer for each other. You know, right. I think that's really important. Right. So yeah. important. 
So we want to shift gears and talk about your PhD a little bit. So why did you decide to pursue a PhD? Well, I was not planning on it, (laughs) but my husband actually wanted to get a PhD in theology and I'd always thought I would like to get more education. I just really love studying the Bible and learning theology. And so I thought maybe one day, but I also had no interest in learning theological German, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so I was like, I don't know about this. I don't, I don't think I have that in me. And, and I didn't know what was the obscure, you know, theological question that I really wanted to, you know, my, my husband's dissertation was on the economy of illumination and the gospel of John, like, (laughs) what does that even mean? Awesome. So, um, I just didn't, it didn't make sense. But when we were at Trinity visiting, I had another, it was really weird how both of my grad school entry points were through these kind of chance conversations. So I happened at lunch while Ike was off doing something else. I happened at lunch to sit next to the head of the doctoral department there. And he was asking me about myself and what I was passionate about. And when I told him, and he said, have you ever thought about doing doctoral work? And I said, yes, but I just don't know if a a doctorate in theology makes sense for me. And he said, well, it sounds to me like what you are interested in is not theology, but an educational studies degree. Like you are not so much interested in the deep dive into the theology, but how do I communicate theology to women specifically? And I was like, yes, that sounds really interesting. And the educational studies department is kind of a hybrid of, you learn about you know educational philosophy, but also theology, psychology, sociology, it just like brings them all together. And so they kind of recruited me and Ike together and made like a way for us financially that it would be possible. And so that was another, like, when does this happen? Never, you know, this is very Mm -hmm. weird. And so it must be God opening the door. And so that's, that was how it happened. So did you have to learn? I grew up in Germany. Did you have to learn um, German to? No, 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 because the, so Ike actually did. He had to learn German and French and French was actually what almost did him. He had a dark night of the soul when he was saying (laughs) he wasn't because they don't teach you how to pronounce it. They only teach you how to read it. And I took French all through my growing up and all through college. I took French. And so I would listen to him pronounce these words. And I was like, (laughs) <laughs> not you are not learning French this is terrible. Um, and he kept failing he was like this is why I'm not going to finish my PhD is French um but he had to actually translate German so uh, okay. uh, one of the theologians that he was using through to read the gospel of John one was Saint Augustine and the other was Karl Barth mm-hmm. and so he had to translate a lot of untranslated sermons that Karl Barth had given on the gospel of John. Isn't that crazy? That's wow. kind of cool. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. That's really cool. And, I mean, it was like brutal hours and hours, you know, cause he just had, you know, a class in German and then to translate Bart. Yeah. So, uh, it was, it was really tough, but I wasn't dealing in other languages. So I didn't have to do that thankfully. So you then, so then you just had to do the Greek and the Hebrew. So I'd already done Greek and Hebrew for my MDiv. Okay. And so for my PhD, I didn't have, it's very different for, for the educational studies. My classes were very different than, than Ike's. Like he's, you know, deep diving into theology. I had some theology classes, but I was learning more, like I had a class on critical theory Mm -hmm. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, as much as that is like in a, a huge debate right now, I took a class on it, like at Trinity. And so it was very, it was a completely different experience. Yeah. I like your experience a lot better. I like mine better too. (laughs) You're giving us hope. His, his was lots of, you know, reading Karl Barth in the dungeon of the library, you know, research. And then mine, mine was qualitative research. And so I went and interviewed women for my my research. That was a lot more fun. 
<laughs> but as a side note, did he really, I know it was a lot of hard work, but if he enjoy his, like, is he glad that he chose to do that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he really, okay. he nerds out on that stuff and mm -hmm. I do not at okay. all. No. Now they published his dissertation, right? They did. They, mm -hmm. uh, IVP has a series and they included his dissertation in it, which was pretty amazing. That's really cool. That's mm -hmm. awesome. That's yeah. awesome. So what's your advice for people who are considering a PhD, a doctorate, anything like that? You know, it's hard to say without talking to someone specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because every story is different. You know, one of the things, so, so my dissertation was about why evangelical women go to seminary. I know Lisa, you mentioned you, you read it. Mm -hmm. But for anyone who doesn't know, I was really curious, not many evangelical women go to seminary. And so I decided to do an appreciative inquiry of the women who do go, like what worked, what was present in their life. And so one of the things I discovered was how every woman I, I spoke to, someone had named her calling, had said, I see this gift in you, or have you thought about ministry? Have you thought about seminary? And so that's actually one of the questions I would probably ask. And then I often tell people also when they, they want to know how to discern their spiritual gifts is I say, you know, you could take a test, you could take a test and see what your spiritual gifts test as, but probably an even more helpful way to find out your spiritual gifts is to ask the people that know you well, mm -hmm. and you are believers, because that tends to be how most people discern their call is that there, there was someone in your life, usually multiple people who encouraged you in that direction. And it's important to not brush that off as, oh, they were just being nice, you know, mm -hmm. um, but to know, no, that's actually how God calls his people is through his church. And so if someone has said this to you, if multiple people have said this to you, if your pastor, your professors, whoever, take it seriously because mm. it, there's a good chance that was the Holy spirit commissioning you. So that's one thing I would really encourage women to think about. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, anything else you would like to share that you learned from your dissertation that you may not have thought about before? So one thing that really surprised me was how many women felt guilty for going to seminary and the reason being they didn't know if it made sense financially in the end you know they didn't know if they were going to be able to get a job and so they were taking this pretty big financial risk that they didn't know if it would you know pay off eventually and and because a lot of them love studying the bible they they were like well, this is just a really expensive spiritual retreat <laughs> and, um, and one thing I said to a number of the women I talked to when I was done interviewing them, because you would have, I would talk to women who would say, I just really love studying Greek. And so it just seemed like, does this make sense for me to spend all this money to study Greek if I can't get a job? And I would say to them, first of all, no one loves studying Greek. <laughs> And so if you love studying Greek, then it's because God put that in you, you know, to love it. And if, he, if God put that in you, he put it in you for the good of the church. And so that's not selfish for you to pursue, to steward this thing that God put in you. But the other thing that I think needs to be part of the math, and, and this is what I can't really speak to really strongly without knowing people's individual situations, but part of the reason we need to steward our gifts is that when we do that well, it demonstrates to the women coming behind us how to steward their own gifts. Mm -hmm. And that means it's, it's going to be hard and we might not see the fruit. Mm -hmm. um, one of the analogies I use very often is I, so when we, we were um, living in the Chicago area, getting our PhDs, you know, we would, we were so excited because there's snow every winter, like real snow. 
And if there was a big hill out near where we lived. And so if we were the first ones to go sledding down that hill, it actually was not, it was really slow going because you were carving out that path. And so sometimes you would, gravity would take you in the wrong direction or you would hit a stump, you know, you would just stop and you have to start over, but eventually you would clear out that path. And then each time that you went down it, it compacted it more and more. And so every sledder coming after you was going faster and faster. And one thing I say to women a lot is you are the first sledders. And so that means it's going to be slow going. You are going to fall into a rut. You are going to hit a stump. You know, it's, it's going to be hard. You will face obstacles. It will feel like you're not moving at all. But this work is essential if we want other women to come behind us. And that is going at the end of the day to be, be between like you and God, if that is what he is calling you to. But if, if, if the question is simply, is it worth it? Yes, it's worth it for the church. Is it your call? I, I don't know. But I, I think that that is a really important part of the calculation. Mm, that's so. And, and I think there's the other piece. I don't know. You can correct me if, my, if I'm wrong. Men don't have that same question <laughs> at all. <laughs> like, like, we, like we would never, yeah. like, I don't even, I, and, and I think they would think, you know, can I support a family or is mm -hmm. it, it, yeah. stuff like that? But, but just the ability to go and, and, and sit in seminary and, and have that time to study is a luxury. And um, yeah. And that yeah. I mean, that was at the very end of my dissertation, I have questions for further research because it, you, you are only researching the one question you're researching. And one of them was how many of these dynamics overlap with men and how many of them are unique to women? Because I don't know, I can't think off the top of my head and I'm not saying this never happens, but I don't know many men who wring their hands over whether or not they are selfish for going to seminary. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I'm curious, but I don't have the answer to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but, but, it's, but it's just like any gift. It's almost, it's, it's almost, um, you know, mom guilt is real, but it's, uh -huh. but it's almost foolish to say like, what else would we, would we wring our hands about being in the Bible? Right. Like, uh -huh. like we wouldn't, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, would we wring our hands about living a life that as a Christ follower that, that demonstrates that we, yeah. we, you know, we live what we profess. So it's, um, hmm, maybe, maybe Lisa's going to go to, um, a, a doctorate program now and answer, you know, one of those questions. <laughs> can't rule it out. That's what I'm saying. We can't rule it out. Um, one of the things that I love about Instagram is that it has let me follow a lot of women who are in ministry. When I grew up Baptist, did I know any women in ministry personally? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. No. Um, and so you use Instagram regularly. Mm -hmm. How does that integrate into your calling, into your work as a pastor, into all the other things that you do? Mm hmm that's a great question. So I, I've had to work out my own relationship with Instagram. There was a time early on, and this was part of the spiritual work that went into my first book, Free Me, was how Instagram really lends itself to comparison, but it also lends itself to that feeling excluded, you know, as a, as a woman in ministry, as an author, as a speaker, Instagram shows you the events that you weren't invited to, you know, the conferences you weren't invited to, or the women that you know, that you're friends with other authors. And this is like a real thing that, that, that women authors, women speakers, women that like you look up to, this is a dynamic that we have to wrestle with is, I'm friends with these other women who are authors and they all went on this trip together and I wasn't invited, you know, that kind of a thing. And so years ago, I had to wrestle with that aspect of Instagram where we are shown, you know, information that we would not have used to have had, you know, and it really, it was really hard for me, but I put some boundaries on it and did like a lot of personal spiritual work to 
figure out how to be healthy on Instagram. And then once I got to that place, I've been able to use it much more as like a tool where I really want it to encourage women. I really want to speak truth. I find with both Instagram and Twitter, Facebook less so because Facebook is like an actual dumpster fire. I mean, yes. Twitter is on Facebook still. I thought, Twitter, yeah, I mean, you I, can't like, yeah, I mean, it, yeah. Yeah. It's just like shouting into the wind and Facebook. Um, but Twitter is, is still, I think there's still a little bit of good you can do there. And so getting a sense for what is the feel of each space and what is needed there like what what truth needs to be spoken and twitter and instagram are a little bit different uh but i find it it is a great space to honestly help shepherd other people how to be online like how to be a christian online mm -hmm. i think it has been something that i've felt called to in my own engagement of instagram and then a little bit of what i use instagram for is we are you know, embodied beings. And because Instagram is visual, you have the option to either only show, you know, this curated, perfect vision of everything, or you can let people in a little bit more to mm -hmm. your humanity. And so I like to use Instagram for that as well, a little bit. Um, but mostly I, I like to use it as a teaching tool. Okay. So we, we, um, we had Alexis Dewees on. And we asked her the same question about Instagram because she uh -huh. kind of talked to us through how to how to be hospitable and Christ-like on it. Uh -huh. Do you think that the Apostle Paul would be on social media? It's and Kristen's favorite question. It's, it's my favorite question. Okay, so we're doing the Apostle Paul and Peter. Uh -huh. um, and and if yeah, we should we should throw a third one in there. Okay, we're gonna do Paul, Peter, and Timothy. Do you think they would be on, on social media? And if your answer is yes, what would be their social media of choice? I know that's kind of putting you on the spot right now. Hmm. Not in the questions that we said. Not at all in the questions, but I'm super curious. Yeah. Um, Peter, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, he's like such a people pleaser. If people are there, he wants to be there too. So I feel like Peter would be there. Um, Paul, I think Paul would be too. I I don't know. With with all of them, they're all innovators, but Paul specifically, Paul's innovative and he's he's going to find ways to connect with people in any means possible. And if he can use it to spread the gospel, he's going to. And so I, I think they would, I think they would, would see it as an opportunity to reach people that they couldn't otherwise reach. Good answer. Very good answer. That makes Lucy and I feel <laughs> hey, so. But I do think Paul's motives would be more noble than Peter's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Peter would just get Fair. in trouble Fair. on Twitter, like all the time. He'd have yeah. to he just have to delete them, delete a lot yeah. of tweets. That's what yeah. would happen. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. He would definitely get in trouble on, mm -hmm. uh, on that. Um, okay. You are a pastor, a mom, a wife, um, you have a new book coming out, uh -huh. um, and you're also part of the resilient pastor cohort. Uh -huh. So you're juggling an awful lot. Um, how do you make that decision? Because I know a, a lot of, of our women are, are making hard decisions on what's their responsibility right now and what's not, and what's their season yeah. and what's not. Yeah. How do you decide which, what is yours to do and, and what's not to do? Yeah, for us, there's, there's a lot of things we say no to. And one thing that I recently posted last week, I think on Twitter that I did not expect the blowback that I got for this, but I shared that right now our kids are nine, seven, and four. They are not in any extracurricular activities. We don't do anything after Good. school and we've tried, like we tried signing up my middle for T-ball or something and he hated it. We had our oldest was in gymnastics for a while. He didn't like it. Uh, we've tried to get my daughter who's four to play soccer. She will not do it. And so we were kind of like, okay, we're not going to push our kids to do stuff just to, for the sake of it. 
and then have us driving, you know, them Mm -hmm. all over the place when we're already pretty emotionally strapped just because we've been leading a church plant through a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so we decided this is just going to be a season. It'll probably change where our kids are not doing anything after school and we are prioritizing being together as a family. And you would have thought I tweeted that extracurricular activities were satanic. No, anyone who is doing them is, you know, rebelling against God. (laughs) That sounds like Twitter. (laughs) Yeah. You're like, can you reread what I wrote? I I said, this will probably change. I said, like, this is an option, you know, like, calm down, you guys. So that is something that, that we, we've prioritized is just time together as a family and being present to our kids and knowing what is going on in their little hearts. And that at the end of the day, I, I, none of my kids are going to be NBA players. Like I'm five, two, my husband is five, nine. It's not in the car. <laughs> Soccer players or gymnasts. So, are- yeah. yeah. Well, and also I'm not athletic at all. And and some of my kids who I will not name inherited that lack of <laughs> athleticism. And oh, so my like my oldest, my oldest son really likes coding, you know? That's not, I so, mean, you gotta go with the, you gotta, you gotta go where their interests are. Yeah, and yeah. I'm, I'm saying that as a woman who, is about to get on the road to go to Spartanburg for a volleyball tournament for my 11 year old. And my um, 15 year old is a 16 year old has a track meet as we're speaking. And my nine year old has two baseball games this weekend. So um, it, it it will come. Like, I think that is so wise on on your part because they, they will naturally find. Yeah. 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 And so I don't feel like we need to push them. And so we're just prioritizing in this season where mine and my husband's emotional bandwidth is really strained. We want to make sure we're using that margin, not to like drive them around, but just to be present to them. And so that's a, that's a big thing. And then I have limits on how often I travel. So in this season, I generally only travel once a month. I make exceptions And then usually when I make exceptions, I regret it. (laughs) Like two weeks ago, I traveled twice in a week and that was bananas. So it's, you know, saying no to things because I'm receiving the limits of the season of motherhood, um, but also being resourceful. So I've written three books now and that has meant using little, you know, pockets of time and, you know, piecing them together and sort of asking God to multiply it essentially. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I have a really welcome, welcoming relationship with the limits of this season right now. Do you have a system for how you write? Like when you're in book writing season that you, that you, this is what I do. I need to get the work done. Um, I wish I did. It's, it's, it's hard because my kids are so little. Mm -hmm. And so there's not with this latest book last June, my husband actually organized so that I could go away for a week and work. And I do like outline the books and everything, but it is hard to be as organized and systematic about it as I would like to be. And I think that that will change. Like when I've talked to other women who, whose kids are older they always kind of say, yeah, like when I was writing books at your kid's age, it was like what I was writing felt like the, like dog food. Like, what is, what is this? You know, like, it is not, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's much more being resourceful with whatever time that you have. Mm-hmm. So correct me if I'm wrong here, but while you were talking, I was sitting here thinking, okay, so you pastor and preach, you write books, you travel and speak is, is teaching the common denominator in those things for you or what kind of pulls all of that together for you? Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a teacher at heart. Okay. I really Mm -hmm. love teaching the Bible and I think it goes back to when I was 14 or 15 years old 
was when I really, for the first time, understood what was in scripture. And I remember I was at summer camp, actually, I had a really great counselor who kind of helped it come alive for me. And that was the first time I remember reading the Bible and being like, does anyone know what's in here? Like, (laughs) pretty good, you guys, you know, like this is, I thought this was a bunch of old sayings, but this is actually really good. And I think that has shaped a lot of the way that I teach and preach is I want people to have that same encounter with scripture. Yeah, I love that. Um, We would like to know if you have any advice for women who are called the pastor. Again, some of that depends on your Mm -hmm. context. For some women, they are feeling that call and they feel a ton of support and they have to simply, you know, walk forward. But for other women, that is costly and confusing and difficult and their church might not support it at all. And so if you are in that, that situation, I would say, you know, try to, to do your best to be faithful with the call that God has put on your life without pushing other people to be where you are, you know, that it does not work, unfortunately. Um, but try and, and find people that can advocate for you and, and cheer for you. And, and most importantly, like find other women that understand what the call that you're sensing what it is like because it is very lonely like even in the best of circumstances I'm at a church where I'm a pastor and my husband really supports me and my parents really support me and it is still very very lonely and so I would say prioritize supportive friendships along the way is it lonely because being a pastor, there's a certain, um, there's certain, I, I don't want to say boundaries, but, but I guess I'm going to say boundaries that you don't want to cross. And you feel like it would be, it would be, it would be in some ways lonely to be a pastor to begin with, or is it lonely because of the demands of being a woman and a pastor? It's both. Being a pastor is very lonely, just generally. It's very, very lonely. And a big part of that that I'm just starting to understand is anytime you occupy any position of power, you have a title with power attached to it, no matter how small, it separates you from people. And what they think is that your power kind of puts you up here above the fray and keeps you safe. And so whatever's happening down here is not going to affect you, that your power protects your heart in some way. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, (laughs) but everyone in your church virtually acts like it does. Like they think because of the power you have, or things are going well with your church, that that has protected you and that how they treat you doesn't affect you that much. And that's not true. And so that part of being a pastor is very hard and very lonely. But then on top of that, being a woman where you do have unique experiences where sometimes people talk to you a certain way because you're a woman and that is alienating and it is isolating. And so there, there are, yeah, there, there are things that, that make it isolating. Also, as you mentioned, being a wife, being a mother, Uh, It definitely pulls your body in all these different ways. Like, you know how, do y'all, y'all both have kids? Mm -hmm. Um, That phase where you are, this is like really going there. So, you know, when you like just have babies and you're nursing them, that's like what you're using your boobs for is to nurse your babies. But your husband is still like, (laughs) <laughs> his like, playground <laughs> yeah and so it's like this weird because you're like okay <laughs> those are not your playground right now <laughs> yeah because you're like uh okay this is like serving very different functions right now yes. it's like satisfying people in my life in like very different ways and right. it's weird like it it messes with your identity like you feel split you feel like 
people are laying claim to you in different ways. Yes. And I think that there's a sense in which that is also true when you're a woman pastor is you're bringing a female body into a role that has not seen that female body there before. And so there, there's also like weirdness. <laughs> I don't know how else to like, right. drive it. Um, I'm in a very like, supportive context but even now like when I go to the local pool I, I'm saying to my husband like I can't wear a bikini anymore I'm a pastor you know <laughs> like, and no one told me that it was just right. like right? right you know but is your husband saying I'm not gonna wear a speedo or I'm not gonna take my <laughs> shirt off I'm just gonna swim in a swim shirt you know like yeah no well yeah. I'll, although I will say he will not let me post like if I took a picture of him at the beach now he won't let me post like shirtless photos of him on Instagram mm -hmm. so he is he's kind of he's he sees that as well he's practicing okay. that um but yeah it's there's things like that where you're just negotiating all of those things and my husband's super supportive but he doesn't totally understand all of it and so mm -hmm. just having friends who get it is really it's lonely um well we appreciate just your honesty it is a yeah. breath of fresh air um uh and we all get the not your playground for a while <laughs> <laughs> so that was a great analogy a very yes. brought it in great yes. clarity okay great clarity <laughs> yes 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 um yeah. Um, well, we have so just enjoyed gleaning from you and, and learning from your experience and just the nuggets that you have given us. But like Lisa said at the beginning, we always, we always end with the same question. Okay. And that question is, um, one unexpected thing that I learned in seminary was. Hmm. So the thing that I always tell people that I think is one of the greatest roles that seminary plays is teaching you the mistakes that other Christians made. Ooh, good. So it's not, it's not for you to just like puff yourself up and accumulate knowledge, but it's basically to like protect you from making this, the mistakes that have already been made. Like you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Mm. And I think that's a really great posture towards so much of the doctrine and theology you're learning. That's no, a great, that's, uh, spoke as, as I'm taking a church history class from the Reformation <laughs> to um, <laughs> modern times. I'm like, we are awful, <laughs> yeah. um, just awful. It's in so that that is slightly comforting and terrorizing all at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Well, but it's but amazing. Like the things that, that pastors will think like, this is a cool and like cutting edge new idea. And I'm like, no, like you need to listen to what the, you know, liberal Protestants in the 1800s did. Like you're doing that right now. Like you don't, you think it's new, but this has already been tried and it like didn't work. And it led to like the rise of Hitler, you know, it's like, yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. minor things, minor sure. consequences, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Why history is important is very important. Yeah. As we yeah. do, we, we do learn from the past and, and also it, it is so precious that God left a book mm -hmm. um, that highlights how great we can be and how awful we can be. And, mm -hmm. and that is love. Nobody sends their child out into the world and doesn't warn them um, yeah. of the pitfalls and doesn't encourage them of how beautiful this life can be. Yeah. Um, so, um, so we appreciate you um, and walking, you walking in your gifts and encouraging us to walk in ours. And um, it's just been so just great to hear, hear your story. Well, Thank you for making time for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah.